Hi, I'm Reverend Amy. Thanks for joining us. Today with Jesus, we meet a Samaritan woman at a well. As is painfully obvious to us these days, sometimes life doesn't go as we plan. The Samaritan woman's life hadn't for sure. She'd been married multiple times, and we find her at the community's well at off hours. Perhaps she's trying to avoid people. But there she finds Jesus, and he offers her something far better than well water, living water. What does living water look and taste like for you? As we worship and celebrate the sacrament of baptism today, let's ponder the gift of living water gushing up to eternal life. So let's take a deep breath, center ourselves, and prepare to worship God together. We come here to draw water, thirsty for new life. We come here to draw water, bringing our past and our present, our messy truths and our deepest scars. We come here to draw water, carrying shame and in need of grace. Fortunately for us, God always meets us at the well. So breathe deeply and drink up. God is here, the water is clean. Let us worship God.
Like the woman at the well, we so often are unraveled by shame. We carry shame for broken relationships. We carry shame for being unable to balance work and parenting, tithing and bills, productivity and Sabbath. We get stuck in a comparison game and in critical self monologues, consumed with the nagging feeling that we should be able to do more. Forgive us for forgetting that we are made in your image. Forgive us for forgetting that you see us and love us as we are. Unravel the shame that unravels us. Gratefully we pray. Amen. Good morning, friends. I'm so glad you could join us today. We're here today in Lake Winnipesaukee in the state of New Hampshire. I've been thinking this week about the many ways our lives have changed since we started to social distance back in March. This week, I thought about some of the good changes. For instance, since we have not been able to meet in our church building, we have learned or remembered that we, the people of all ages and shapes and sizes and colors, are the church. It's not our building where we worship that's our church, it's the people. This has been a great reminder to me that Jesus is everywhere we are. It's also been a good lesson for me to remember to live a life of faith every day, not only Sunday when we go to church. So I asked myself, what does it mean to be a Christian every day? I thought I'd start with Jesus' greatest commandments. One, he said, love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And two, Jesus reminded us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Hmm, how can we live these commandments every day? Well, I have a couple of ideas. First, how do we love God every day? We can pray or we can talk to him wherever we are, anytime. And we can look for God. When you need to make choices, look to God or ask him, what is the right decision to make? What does he say to your heart? And how can we love our neighbor? Well, here's a couple of easy ways. We can wear a mask. Nowadays, when we're around people, we can help keep each other healthy by wearing a mask and social distancing. We could also check in on our lonely neighbors or friends who need some help or support during this time. Today, we have a really special event to celebrate. It's a very important event in the life of a Christian. Let me give you a few hints. See if you can guess what special event we're going to celebrate today. First, we call this very special event a sacrament. Second, this special event involves water. Third, this special event signifies a holy gift from God. And finally, when we as Christians attend this event, we have an important job to do. Hmm, any guesses? If you guessed baptism, you're correct. Today is very special because we will celebrate the baptism of Spencer. Do you know what baptism signifies? Baptism shows us that God has given us the gift of salvation and that we have joined the church, what we call the body of Christ. Everyone can join the church. God welcomes all people of all races and ages and nations. What is our job at a baptism? Yes, Christians, as Christians at a baptism, we have a job. Our job is to remember our promise to God to work together to support each other in living out God's commandments every day. How can we support Spencer every day? Well, we can pray for him, we can love him, and we can forgive him as God has done for us. You could send Spencer a card or send him an email to congratulate him on this really special event and day today. If you don't have a 
email or address for Spencer, send me an email at education at delmarmethodist.org and I will help you get in touch with Spencer. Finally, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us every day, everywhere, all the time. Thank you for sharing your love today with Spencer and please help us to support Spencer and all of your children today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For Sunday School this week, you have a job. I want you to come up with ideas of how to live Jesus' greatest commandments every day. And I want you to pr then put into practice using these ideas every day. Remember, those greatest commandments are to love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and to love your neighbor. I hope you have a wonderful week and I'll see you again next Sunday. Beloveds in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Today we come to baptize Spencer Clinton Neal in these living waters of the Christ who has raised us, the spirit who has birthed us, and the creator who is making all things new. So I'm going to ask you on behalf of the whole church, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil and injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races? I do. And Spencer, according to the grace given to you, will you remain a faithful member of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? If so, I will. And let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and Spencer who receives it, to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ he may share in his final victory. Come upon us, Holy Spirit, come upon these waters. Let these waters be to us drops of your mercy. Let these waters remind us of your righteousness and justice. Let these waters renew in us the resurrection power of Jesus. Let these waters make us long for your coming reign. Eternal God, one and three and three and one. All glory is yours now and forever. Amen. All right, Spencer. <laughs> I baptize you in the name of the Father. <laughs> and of the Son. <laughs> And of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> May the blessing of God who shelters us like a mother hen, her chicks be with you today and always. Amen. Amen. All right, now you get to place your hands on Spencer for the blessing. So you're all connected up. Very good. 
<laughs> Very good. <laughs> Spencer Clinton, the Holy Spirit work within you that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we're also going to remember our baptism, all of us, and be thankful. <laughs> so let us pray. Renew in us, O oh God, all the gifts of baptism, strength for life's journey, courage in time of suffering, the joy of faith, the freedom of love, and the hope of new life. Through Jesus Christ, who makes us one, send us in your name, Holy One. Amen. So now we welcome Spencer, the world's newest and wettest socially distanced baptized Christian. Yay! <laughs> You're baptized. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I think Angela was too. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Water, river, spirit, and grace sweep over me, sweep over me. Recarve the depths your fingers trace in sculpting me, in sculpting me. Today's scripture reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 1 through 29. Listen now for word and wisdom. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John. Although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized, he left Judea and started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So when he came to a Samaritan city called Segar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jewish man, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband, and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see you are a prophet. Our ancestor, ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he.
the one who is speaking to you. When the disciples, when just then his disciples came, they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? Words to bring God near. For the word of God in Jesus. For God's wisdom all around us. For God's word and wisdom in us. Thanks be to God. I'd like to say that I'm not one to complain, but honestly, I enjoy a good complaining session as well as the next person. I admit it. But I think this is a well-founded complaint. It is really discouraging to have yet another story in the Bible with a woman without a name. Granted, there are unnamed men as well, but it is more unusual for a woman to have a name. We aren't surprised to hear that the culture of that time and place didn't value women highly, we still have our struggles with this today. Women were more often thought of as property, second-class citizens, the carriers of male offspring, and in the should be seen and not heard category, and probably not seen all that much. So it's no surprise that this woman isn't named. Plus, she is a Samaritan, a foreigner, until you consider that Jesus was traveling through her country that's kind of like us traveling to the Canadian side of Niagara Falls and calling all the Canadians there foreigners. What probably was a bigger deal was that the Samaritan woman was a member of Israel's enemy. Samaritans and Jews did not get along well at all. Never mind that they had common shared history and many similarities in their religion even. Their differences made them bitter enemies. So one could wonder why Jesus was going through enemy territory in the first place, but that is something to ponder at another time. Back to my complaint about the woman not having a name. Putting aside all the reasons why women weren't valued and therefore rarely mentioned by name, there is still another reason to complain. It is inconvenient while preaching. What do I call her? The Samaritan woman at the well kind of long and tedious to repeat every time, the initials T-S-W-A-T-W to Swatwa don't really roll off the tongue. Sam for short, while kind of kicky, seems too modern. In my research, I did discover that Orthodox Christians have a tradition of calling her Saint Fotini. The tradition is that the apostles baptized her and called her Fotini, the enlightened one. I love this. The problem is, because this is new to me as a Protestant, that Fotini sounds too much like Martini, or like the name of a magician, the great Fotini. So that isn't going to work for me. It seems another Greek variation of her name is Fotini. So that is what I shall call her. Our scripture today is a lengthy and complicated one. It is one of the longer stories in the Bible, but it is also one of the scriptures in which we weave so many assumptions that they cloud our perception of the story. It is hard to hear it for what it is really saying with our perceptions and misperceptions crowding in. In the previous chapter of John's Gospel, we hear the story of Nicodemus, who came at night to talk theology with Jesus. Nicodemus was a respected Jewish religious leader. In John's Gospel, light and dark imagery is pretty important. Nicodemus coming to talk to Jesus at night implied that he was in the dark. He didn't really get Jesus' teaching. He wasn't a fully committed disciple of Jesus. The woman at the well, Fotin, is a different story in many ways. First of all, instead of talking with a male named member of the religious establishment, Jesus talks to a female member of an enemy people who has no name. It's quite a striking contrast. Fotin herself notes the scandal of their conversation 
how is it that you, a Jewish man, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus shouldn't be talking to a Samaritan woman, let alone drinking out of Samaritan vessels. Remember how shocked the disciples are when they show up on the scene? Verse 27 reads, Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or, Why are you speaking with her? So we can see, based on their reaction, that the disciples don't get this following Jesus thing quite yet. Jesus is a boundary breaker. The disciples, not so much. They are a little shook up to see Jesus breaking the rules of the day. But Jesus goes ahead and breaks boundaries between male and female, the chosen people and rejected people. Just by talking to Fotin, Jesus shows that God's grace is available to all people. He challenges the status quo of cultural and social conventions by offering the water of life to a Samaritan woman. Scholars and commentators on this text over the years have had an easier time accepting that Jesus offered grace, living water, to a Samaritan than to a woman, the less valued gender. People show that discomfort by questioning her moral character. And they do that by questioning her intellectual or theological ability to debate Jesus. They try to make Fotin look small. It's a pretty popular to assume that Fotin had loose morals, that she was a floozy, which is the old fashioned word I will use for the harsh words that characterize Fotin's reputation. It comes from verses 16 to 18. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Fotin tells Jesus that she has no husband and Jesus replies by telling her stuff about her life that she couldn't believe he could possibly know. This is where the floozy part comes in. The scripture doesn't say that she's been divorced five times, but that she's had five husbands. There are many reasons why this could be. To say she's morally lax is a stretch. She could have been in a marriage custom of the day, Leverite marriage, where the brother marries the deceased brother's wife. Perhaps the brother wouldn't marry her or she may not have been able to have children. We don't know what the circumstances of her life are. The interesting thing is that while we get all excited thinking that she is a lippy floozy talking back to Jesus, we aren't really seeing that in the scripture. And Jesus doesn't pass moral judgment on Fotin. Interpreters have done that. Some have called her a five-time loser or a tramp. They are speaking about their prejudices more than what is in the actual scriptural text. If we look back again at that part of the conversation about her husbands without the baggage, we see some things a little differently. It shows that Jesus sees and knows all things. This is an important theme of John's Gospel. This is an enlightening moment for Fotin. She sees Jesus in a new light because of it. She responds to him saying that she has no husband with, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. It's like Jesus knows all the passwords for her life. This back and forth doesn't reveal that the woman is immoral. Instead, it shows her faith grow. It's key to remember that she now, going forth in her conversation, sees Jesus as a prophet. Fotin asks Jesus the question that separates the Jews and the Samaritans. Where is the proper place to worship? This woman is smart. She sees a prophet before her and she knows enough to ask him some good questions. Some commentators say that she changes the subject away from her embarrassing moral state. But what we have here is a woman engaging Jesus in a theological discussion. If we were to continue reading the gospel, the conclusion of the story is pretty satisfying to Jesus' followers. 
when the disciples return from the city. The woman leaves to go to the city to tell her fellow townspeople about Jesus. Based on what she said, many of them believe in Jesus and want to go hear him too. In John's Gospel, that is a mark of making disciples. To see Jesus and tell others about seeing him is a primary mark of discipleship in John's Gospel. John the Baptist did it. Jesus' first follower, followers did it as well. Now, Fotin does it too. She is an example for us all. In the Orthodox Christian tradition, she is called Saint Fotin and is called equal to the apostles because she led so many people to follow Jesus. This is hard to see when we read the story and immediately think that this woman is a sassy hussy talking back to Jesus. It takes quite a lot of digging to read the Bible for what it says and not what we think it says or what we may want it to say. How often do we do that to each other? We look at someone and we think we know that person's life story and we have a label ready. It can take a lot of work to suspend judgment. But here we have another example of Jesus not only not judging, but crossing over into enemy territory. Usually when it comes to our enemies, we think anything goes. We tend to relax our standards of what is appropriate or humane when our enemies are involved. Who among us hasn't had satisfying daydreams about what we'd like to do to someone we don't like? That's why we have rules about the treatment of enemy combatants and prisoners of war. Not only is Jesus showing us by example how to not judge, but he is offering an enemy the most precious thing, living water. Fotin takes Jesus a little literally at first. After all, how much of her life must be, have been spent retrieving water? It's heavy, hard work. How odd it must have seemed that someone who is offering living water has no bucket. Where and how is he going to get living water if he has to ask me for a drink? She must have wondered. She quickly realizes what this living water is, and she realizes who is offering it, the Messiah. Does this remind you a little of Mary Magdalene crying in the garden after Jesus has been crucified? She goes to anoint his body and his body is gone. She has a conversation with the gardener and in the midst of talking with him realizes who he is. It's like that with Fotin. She realizes who, she, who he is talking to her and her faith grows mid-conversation. She doesn't keep it to herself under the cloak of darkness. She shares it in broad daylight in her town. How easy it is to make very poor life choices. Labels can so easily be put on us for what we do or say, and labels can stick. We know the pain of that. We carry heavy burdens of guilt and shame. We have all made decisions we wish we hadn't. We all have a past. The good news is that Jesus offers us living water, abundant, full life, and he doesn't read our labels. Labeling is one of the worst things we can do to ourselves and to others. Can the complexity of your life and gifts be reduced to just a couple of descriptive words, just a couple of actions? Unless we are slapping the label, beloved child of God, on ourselves and on others, we're wasting our time. Where are you parched and dry? When do you find yourself too tired to keep going back to the well? Where in your life do you need a spring bubbling up to eternal life, a gushing fountain of endless life? Life is hard. We all know that. It is especially during these pandemic days. It is filled with heartaches. And sometimes we're our own worst enemies. But Fotin's story gives us hope. Let's look at this unlikely evangelist, this woman without a name, who shares the good news brought by her enemy. This woman who shares a cup of living water with others, the others who have judged her harshly. She tells her community, come and see the man who's told me everything I have ever done. Gossip is turned into good news. The woman with a past is a woman with a future 
that bubbles up to eternal life. She goes down in history as one who shares the good news. She is an evangelist. Come and see the man who knows all about me. How brave of her to say that, to take what was said of her about her and turn it around and give it as a gift to give others life. Come and see the man who knows all about me. But I think it was what she didn't say that is implied. Come and see the man who knows all about me and loves me anyway. That is the power. That is the good news. That is the living water. We live in community. We know all about each other. And some of what we know may even be true. Let's be a church that's about the loves me anyway part. The unspoken part. Let's speak it. Let's be it. Lives may very well depend on it. That's the good news. The juicy news may be all the ways that we mess up, that makes for good gossip, good social media, good movies, etc. How often that tears people down when we are called to be the people who build up. How often that pushes people into very dark places when we are called to be light. It leaves us thirsty, wanting more, more dirt, more judgment, more details to the story. But Jesus is offering us something more, the waters of life, real life, abundant life, life in him, living waters that will not leave us thirsty ever again. With Fotin, let us tell that story. Let us be that story. Don't let anything define you other than beloved child of God. Jesus knows all about us and loves us. Jesus offers us all living water. Come, draw from the spring, gushing up to eternal life. Come, drink. Water, river, spirit, and grace, sweep over me, sweep over me. Recarve the depths your fingers trace, in sculpting me, in sculpting me. Loving God, help us to hear the voices of others in our world as Jesus noticed the woman at the well. Help us to notice and care. Holy Creator, give us strength to speak up and tell our stories. Show us the places in this world where our realities can be held as true and holy and valuable. Gracious Provider, we thank you that you have given us the diversity of experience from which to learn and grow. Silently, in unity of prayer, we recognize those people and places and we lift them up to you now. We thank you, beloved Jesus, for walking this journey with us and giving us companions of love and justice. Show us how to be a people united and in true communion with each other through our baptism into your church. For all who feel silenced and shamed, we lift our voices in compassion for all who feel treated like property, we pray for your dignity and renewal. For all who have suffered the indignities of patriarchy and the oppressions of power mongering, we pray for healing and wholeness. 
may we be one. May we be true in our pursuits of your ways. Amen. And we continue in prayer, praying the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said, freely, freely you have received, freely, freely. will know that I live. All power is given in Jesus' name, in earth and heaven, in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his power as he told me to. He said, Go in the peace of Christ. Go thirsty for living water. Go and search the springs gushing up to eternal life. Go and offer living water to others in the name of the one who showers us with abundant grace and love. Go in peace.
Thanks for being with us today. Have a good week. And until we meet again, may you find springs of grace, springs of living water gushing up to eternal life all around you. And may you share a cup of that grace with a thirsty friend, with a thirsty world. See you here next week.